was in Los Angeles and John phoned me up and just put the, the seed of the idea in my mind, you, me and Tony Ashton. And I just sat on it for a week and thought about it. And it seemed like a fun idea. not been involved in a new band for eight, nine years. You know, Deep Purple was our way of life and we knew what to expect. And so to start this new band was immensely exciting. established musicians, I would imagine it would always be in your head, you've got to think of it as a chancy affair, because you know, you're never sure whether the audience are going to switch their allegiance from one kind of music to another, especially in terms of PAL, which is a, a very big switch from Deep Purple sort of music. We advertised in, uh, in the musical press for a bass player and guitarist. And we had something like 150 applicants. Basically, the auditions were held to see who was out there. I, I think that the music business is in danger of becoming slightly incestuous, if it's not careful, feeding upon itself, always going to establish known people, so that in the end it's uh, a vicious circle, whereby unknown musicians who may be technically extremely able find no way of, of entering the business. There were two or three musicians who were really, really excellent, fine musicians, who we couldn't take because they simply were not right for Pace Ashton Lord. And it's very, very difficult to tell a guy, I'm sorry. But I still believe it was the correct way to do it, to hold auditions. I wish more bands would do it when, the, you know, new bands are forming. I think that they'd find a, a sort of an enormous amount of excellent, undiscovered talent, as we did. the auditions at an old cinema in Fulham. Quite a doomy place, but uh, good for the purpose. Both Paul and Bernie came in with a considerable amount of confidence, which impressed me. When Bernie plugged in and started playing, it was like a breath of fresh air. Same with Paul. Very solid, very confident, very enjoyable to play with. And th these were some of the things we were looking for. Not just whether the, the guy could play his axe or not, but whether he had that <laughs> ring of confidence. Bernie was with a band called Babe Ruth, and in actual fact, he was recommended to us by Cozy Powell, because Bernie did a short stint with Cozy's band when Cozy had a band called Hammer. And Paul uh, was with a band called Stretch.
and we all finally got together in Munich and before we started recording we did a few days of just putting some pieces together and that was really the first time that Paul and Bernie had played with us you know for an extended period of time my song actually. It's had these chords floating around in my head for a long time that I wanted to use and they fitted together with the way I felt sometimes at night in, the, in that big monolithic bloody hotel. The people actually come from miles around in Chony to actually leap off the, the, the hotel which is like a 22-story building. It's like the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. That's the kind of place it is, a big monolith. Music lands in the basement of the hotel we stay at, and that's the Arabella. It's a great big square modern concrete block, really. It, it is handy because you just uh, go downstairs, walk 200 yards, and you're in the studio. So it has its pluses and has its minuses. A new outfit's always exciting because you, you really can't rely on past form, you can't rely on knowing or thinking you, you know what the other person's going to do. There's only sort of John that I could have that sort of rapport with because although I've known Tony for a long time as a friend, but I've, I've only done musical work with him a couple of times. And of course, Bernie and Paul I'd never played with before. Play the rest and then, and then, and then settle down. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll now play you the refrain from spitting. Don't spit on the floor. <laughs> Don't spit on the floor. On the B flat. Stop. Basically, to make an album, or the way we do it at least, is a question of getting bits and pieces of ideas together, separately and among yourselves, and just thrashing them out and seeing what seems good to you. Then it's just a question of when you've arrived at the song, of thrashing it out, shouting, arguing, storming out getting angry or whatever it takes until you've got the right take. And later you, you sit and listen to the take and think, well, why was it so hard? It seemed so easy. One of the tracks on the album, for example, took about half an hour. Another track took five days before we got the final take. We left it and came back to it again, left it again and came back to it. Couldn't get it right at first. It's a question of trial and error until you arrive at what you think is the best take. People seem to have forgotten the humour, and I think that's an essential part of it. Very, very important. And with Tony Ashton, you can't really fail to have anything else but an element of humour. Quite poetic. More Poe than Etic, but... Uh, more Poe than Etic, yes. More Poe than Etic. More Poe than Etic. Anyway, it's got Poetic. 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 Poetic.
soundtrack for the song Malice in Wonderland was very difficult to get together. Um, we tried it on one of the other chord sequences first and it didn't work. And then finally, again, late one night, we were just banging away at some chords, just messing around, really. And a, a thing started to take shape. And it was just so right for the words and the idea for Malice in Wonderland that that's how that one came about. <laughs> That's the end, right? Well, it can fade. Yeah. I mean, that will not be the end. No, 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 no I was just going to ask. I'm Mr. Beat. It needs something to click them into place. Ian, Tony and I were downstairs in the studio around the piano, and Paul and Bernie were upstairs in their room playing away at other ideas to try and get this song together. So it was a very collective effort, eventually. <laughs> when we first started talking about the band that we would use a brass section. It adds another tone colour to the band which it already has with the two keyboard players um, as well as the guitar. Um, no, I think we'd like to try it with the track again. Will you just <laughs> 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 Should we get around without a box? Um, and then if it really is essentially oh, wrong, we'll now. have to try another way. Okay? We'd known Howie Casey for a long, long time and always respected him as a player. So we decided to try and steal him from Mr. McCartney. And we asked Howie to put together a horn section. Excellent.
fun. Of course, there were the ladies, the singers. Howie knew Sheila and said she had a unique sort of voice, very, very low, very husky, which uh, would be a nice change from the usual uh, run-of-the-mill everybody trying to sound like black chick thing. You know? And uh, also had a sister who sang. I'm missing yeah, it, is right, yeah? Yeah, fault, my You're fault. right, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm missing it every time. One, two, three. Yeah. One, two. Three. Oh, that's nice, yeah. Who did that? Mm -hmm. Who? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what? Sorry. Yeah, right. Just, just try again. It'd be nice, wouldn't it, I think? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, good luck, studio. Here we go. I think so, it's Kanga. Yeah, yeah, chocks away. <laughs> dealy, dealy. <laughs> If we get together, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little smoothie Ashton, you are. You certainly are, he said, with his eyes lasciviously following his hat. <laughs> How's it going, John? Oh, I don't know. Good, huh? Yeah. Great stuff. <laughs> because uh, of the good rehearsal facilities there. We started on a small sound stage with just the five-piece version of the band and then we moved onto a larger sound stage where we had the, the stage that we would had built set up and started rehearsing with the full lights and the full sound system and the, the brass and lady singers and uh, the team. We've got some brilliant people around us, you know, the lighting guy and the sound guy and our road crew. They make it easier for us to get on with our job. And uh, it's running very well. It's a good machine.
called uh, the press reception. Well, the press booze up. <laughs> and a band booze up, don't you think of it? Maybe no more than uh, three or four days between the last rehearsal and the first concert. So that all those weeks of getting it right are still very fresh when you initially hit the road. From then on, it's the public's decision that, that says everything. is going to be the first concert without a doubt I mean I'll be I'll be nervous I always get nervous before I show anyway to a certain extent but this first concert with Pay Session Lord I'll be a shivering wreck without a doubt I may not show it <laughs> but underneath it'll be all jelly I was petrified actually because even with before family with Ashton Gardner and Dyke I, I used to sit down by a piano mostly and now I'm sort of be front man in the way. That was worrying me slightly. If you do get the nervous flutters before a concert, the moment you hit the stage, they tend to go away. I'm fairly lucky that, that I don't get too spaced out by it. But uh, on a thing like Birmingham, which was the first one ever, once I was nervous, I was just a little taut. I told you my camera. 